Hi, Grandi Series. You might not have heard of this person's name, a very famous Italian mathematician and monk from about 300 years ago, but you might have seen the series that I'm referring to. There it is. It's the infinite sum, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. Think about it for a moment. What do you think the answer would be? Remember that the 1s and minus 1s go on forever. Well, let's see what happens. Maybe you tried grouping them in pairs, as shown there, and each pair is 0. So really what you end up with is getting the infinite sum to be the sum of infinite number of zeros which of course is zero. Is that the only solution? If it is a solution, perhaps you tried grouping them in a slightly different way as shown there, where you keep the first number, the first term, one, and group every two from then on. And then each pair of numbers in each bracket is zero. So you end up getting one plus an infinite number of zeros, which of course is equal to one. We seem to have a contradiction. In the first method, g1, the infinite sum, was 0, and in the second method, g2, the infinite sum was equal to 1. Intriguing. Is there another way? What about if we group it as shown there? Now, what do we notice? If you notice the sequence or the series in brackets, remember they go on forever. Isn't that our original sequence? So we can replace it by g3, like that. And now, a bit of algebra. Let's work out what G3 is by rearranging. If we add G3 to both sides of the equation, we end up with 2G3 equals 1, and then divide both sides by 2. So we end up getting G3 equals a half. So we have yet another solution. We have 0, 1, and a half. Surely we can't have three separate answers. Which one do we accept as the true answer? Are all three correct, or none of them are correct? What do you think? Since Grandy first proposed this infinite sum, there was a lot of infighting amongst mathematicians about exactly this problem. And since then, it's generally agreed in the mathematics community that the answer is a half. And what we're going to do now is look at why in some different ways. And the first way is to first of all understand what we mean by the partial sum. Now first, we need to understand that a series is convergent if there is a limit to the sequence of its partial sums. Convergent means that if we take more and more terms of the sequence, it approaches a certain limit, a definite value. Now let's try it on our sequence. The first partial sum which we will call P1, is equal to 1. The second partial sum is the sum of the first two terms, which is 1 minus 1, and that is equal to 0. The third partial sum is the sum of the first three terms, which is 1. The fourth partial sum is 0. You can probably guess what's happening now. The fifth partial sum is 1, and so on. So we have a sequence of partial sums, namely 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on, going on forever. Is this helpful in any way? There is no unique limit because it oscillates between 0 and 1, so we can't say the series is convergent, which is one of the requirements for showing that there is an infinite sum. However, we said that a half is the accepted solution. So how can we justify that the sequence of partial sums is not giving us the required answer? Grandy couldn't do it at the time, but it's now left to another mathematician. So Grandy's series is actually divergent, but to justify what he found, and he suggested that the sum was a half, he gave a scenario. Grandy tried to justify that the sum is equal to a half with the following story. Once there was a rich Italian merchant who had two sons, let's call them Luigi and Nino, and before he died, he left in the custody of both of them a diamond, and he left it on the condition that it was never to be sold 
never to be cut and that each son must take turns in keeping it and then to pass it down for generations to each of their families who will also keep it one at a time. From that, Grandy concluded that for all generations to come, the diamond would be held in the ratio of a half by each family. Let's see how that works. And we can see what's happening to the ratio. Both families, the fraction or decimal becomes a half, 0.5, as the time gap decreases or approaches zero. There we go. Very close to a half, 0.5. Another way of looking at it is to look at the partial sums. Think of those vertical lines as representing one and zero. In other words, the two suns who are sharing the diamond represented by the yellow sphere. As the time decreases between the families holding the diamond, you can see that the time taken reduces accordingly. And in the limiting case, it approaches halfway, 0.5. But it was left to another mathematician, Ernesto Cesaro, around about the same time, who showed that if we look at not just the partial sums, but the mean of the partial sums, then we might get a limit existing. So here are the partial sums that we found. Let's work out the arithmetic mean of each sequence of partial sums. The first partial sum is one. so. The mean, of course, is just P1 divided by 1 because there's only one term. The second partial sum means the arithmetic mean of the first two partial sums, which is P1 plus P2 over 2, and that comes out to be a half. If we do the same thing for the third partial sum, as you can see, that comes out to be 2 thirds. The fourth one comes out to be 2 over 4, which, of course, simplifies to a half. The fifth to 3 fifths and so on. And the sixth partial sum comes out to be 3 over 6 or a half. And just to summarize that, this is what we get for the arithmetic mean of the partial sums. Notice that it seems to consist of two subsequences, the ones shown in black and the ones in red. They're the ones in black and the sequence in red. Can we conclude anything from that? Each term of the first sequence and we can refer to that as Tn, is defined by n over 2n minus 1, where n is a whole number, positive whole number. So for example, the second term, which is 2 thirds, you can find by replacing n with 2, so it will be 2 over 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 2 thirds. And from that, if we let n approach infinity, because remember we are taking the infinite sum, then that simplifies to a half because the denominator 2n minus 1 approaches 2n as n approaches infinity, and then we have n over 2n, and the n's cancel, which will leave us with a half. So the first subsequence, if you like, approaches a half as n approaches infinity, and the second one in red, of course, is straightforward. Each of those terms is already a half. So we can conclude from that, that if we take the arithmetic mean of the partial sums, then we get a half. So Grandy had proposed the right infinite sum, but was not able to prove it until Cesaro came along. But there are other ways of showing that the sum is a half. We will look at some of these ways. And the first method, called the substitution method, can be accredited to another famous mathematician, Leibniz. And he showed, based on the equation that we have at the start, that 1 over 1 plus 1 equals 1 over 1 minus 1 over 1 plus 1, that using successive substitutions will give you the Grandy expression, the Grandy series. And this is how he did it. That's what we start with. And instead of 1 over 1 plus 1, you can replace it with 1 minus 1 over 1 plus 1 because that's what 1 plus 1 is equal to. And after you've done that, that's what you end up with. And we can continue that. Each time we can now replace 1 over 1 plus 1 by 1 minus 1 over 1 plus 1. And we have that expression. And make the substitution again. And maybe just one more. And we can continue indefinitely in this manner. So what do we end up with this? We end up that on the left hand side 1 over 1 plus 1 is a half. 
and on the right hand side if you expand the brackets you'll end up with the terms 1 minus 1 and so on. So that method seems to work doesn't it? Here's another way. Will this method work? We divide to get an infinite series. Let's suppose we start with the expression 1 over 1 plus x. We can employ long division and some of that is shown there to end up with the infinite series shown on the top 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed and so on. And this is only valid when x is not equal to negative 1. Because if x is negative 1, then we would be dividing by 0, which is a no-no in mathematics. If we let x equal 1 in the division, we end up getting 1 over 1 plus 1 equals 1 minus 1 plus 1 squared and so on. And that gives us the required sequence, that a half is equal to Grundy's series. So this method seems okay. Here's another one we could try, finding the infinite sum of a geometric series. So let's suppose those terms, a plus ar plus ar squared and so on, are the terms of a geometric series. That means each time we multiply each term by the common ratio, which we call r, to get the next term. It turns out that if the value of r, the common ratio, is between negative 1 and 1, then the infinite sum comes out to be a, the first term, divided by 1 minus r, the common ratio. And just as an example, let's suppose we have that geometric series, and that's what graphically would look like. The terms, they are obviously converging to zero and oscillating at the same time. But for this series, the first term a is 100, and the common ratio is negative a half or negative 0.5. So if we make the substitution for the infinite sum, it comes out to be 66 and 2 thirds. Let's apply that to our Grandy series. We can write a equals 1, the first term, and the common ratio is negative 1 because we are multiplying each time by negative 1 to get the next term. And plugging that into our expression a over 1 minus r, we get a half, which seems to work, doesn't it, as the infinite sum. But hold on, there's a problem. The infinite sum formula a over 1 minus r, as was stated at the top, is only valid, it's only true when the value of r is between negative 1 and 1. We use the value of r equals negative 1, which is not allowed. So even though this method seems to work, it is not a valid mathematical proof. Finally, we can look at this method, which Grandy had a hand in developing. He used what is known as a curve called the Witch of Agnesi curve, and that curve is described by the equation y equals 8a cubed over x squared plus 4a squared. And there's the graph of it for a value of a equals a half. It involves division again. If we use long division, something like that, you can see the infinite series that we get, which is 2a minus 1 over 2ax squared and so on. And then if we let a equal a half and x equal 1, that's what we get for the left side and the right side. And then simplifying all of that, lo and behold, we get the well-known Grandy series to give us an infinite sum of a half. And this seems to be a valid proof. I hope you've enjoyed this basic presentation of a well-known sequence and I suggest that you explore other aspects of it and other related sequences. Until next time, bye-bye.